Thank you very much. Uh, and and I, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be here. So uh, they gave me 20 minutes, and in those 20 minutes, I think if you're going to give a speech and you only have 20 minutes, you basically what you should do is you take, to take one statement and try to twist it a bit, and you should present one truth or one idea or one concept that you believe in. So to begin, the idea that I would like to turn upside down is this concept of all business is local. So let me share a short, quick example. This is actually an uh, example of my wife. My wife is from the Manila, from the Philippines. We live in Singapore. I'm Swedish, and a few months back, she decided that she wanted to buy the TV series West Wing about the White House in America. She goes down to a local shop in Singapore, tries to buy it, finds it too expensive, and decides, let's see if I can find it cheaper somewhere else. So she goes online. She goes to Australia and to, the, to eBay in Australia, and she finds it cheaper there. So she orders it. One week later, we get a box. <laughs> and I'm a bit surprised, because the box doesn't come from eBay. It doesn't even come from Australia. It comes from Amazon in Germany. <laughs> so I'm a curious person. So I said, what happened here? So obviously, I go to Amazon Deutschland. <laughs> Turns out that West Wing is cheaper in Deutschland than in Australia. Probably because Germans prefer to watch TV series in German and not dubbed into English. Yeah, it's true. So if you want to sell an English TV series, you, you have to sell it for a lower price. So this is what happened. A Filipino woman living in Singapore decides to buy an American TV series from an American company based in Australia, but it gets shipped from an American company based in Germany. And how did I get it? Because probably a guy in Bangladesh realized that he can make $30 on every order. <laughs> and send it to his friend in Singapore. <laughs> and all business is local. If that's true, which local was this? <laughs> so I would like to change the statement from not all business is local to all business is local except the business that is global. <laughs> and what I think you are totally aware, I know that you are totally aware of, is that real estate used to be the most, global, the most local thing there was. Because you cannot move a house and you cannot move a plot of land. But what has happened in your industry, and quite recently so, is that the global property market became global, with global money throwing and so on. And that has changed your industry dramatically. But not only your industry, and that's my point. So what I decided to do is I want to go study companies around the world where this is happening. So the idea that I'm going to share with you today is the concept of what I call the global divide. Now, what I mean by the global divide, I will soon tell you, but for first, very quick introduction of myself. So I write business books. For the last 17 years, I've been writing business books. My most famous book is called The Idea Book. It's I've been included in this book, which is called The 100 Best Business Books of All Time. Yes, I'm very proud of that. Let, let's read the ending one more time. Of all time. <laughs> It's a book written by my mother. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a book, and this is the point. It's a book written by two Americans, and I'm, a very, I'm one of very few non-Americans on the list. And more importantly, I'm the only person on that list who is living in Asia. I've been living in Asia for six years. But even more importantly, I go around the world and I give talks. And I used to give talks on creativity and innovation, period. So this is not a talk on that. So why am I giving a talk about being a global company? Because I am a global person. I have been invited to speak in all industries around the world, in actually in 45 different countries in four, five continents. Uh, just this week, I'm in Hong Kong today, Singapore tomorrow, Beijing on Friday, and Dubai on Saturday. All right? That's what I do. I go around the world and I talk, mostly on innovation. But what I realized doing this for the last 10 years we're doing it outside Sweden, was that there is something happening in the world, and it's happening around roughly right now. And that's what I call the global divide. So let me explain what I mean by that. I wrote my first book in 1995, and the title was Internet and Marketing. 
That was the first book on internet marketing published at least in Sweden, I mean, not in the world, but in Sweden. It was a book very early about what it meant, what this internet thing was, and how it was going to change the world. Interestingly enough, is to say, it didn't happen in 1995. It's happening now. And it's interesting to see how all the speakers are talking about how your industry is really being transformed now by the internet. It took a while, but it happened. Now, during the 1990s, we used to talk about something which, which was called the digital divide. The digital divide meant that you could be a very successful business without using the potential of the internet and other digital tools. That you could do fine. But there were some people and some companies who realized that, oh, we have this new thing called the internet, and if we use that, we can become much more successful. And those companies who did that became much more successful and changed industries. Now, the digital divide meant the people who did not see the opportunities, who were living on the other side. Now, the global divide is a similar idea. It means that there are some companies and some people who realize that the world has changed now, and it opens up new opportunities. And you can do great without embracing these, technology, or these ideas or this concept of a global world. But you can do much better if you do. And the thing is, it's happening now. You could argue that, oh, globalization is nothing new. It's been around since Columbus. That's true. But what is new is the new phase of globalization. Just what's happening in your industry is happening in a lot of other industries. For example, SAPA, which makes aluminum profiles. It's a very simple product, aluminum profiles. The last three years, they, their world has changed because the customers who now buy aluminum profiles, for example, IKEA, goes to SAPA and says, we want to buy aluminum from one company and one company only. And that means you need now to be able to sell aluminum profiles to us, regardless if it's in Russia or China or Sweden or Holland. KPMG, which I think you should definitely study because it's a very, I mean, it's a very professional company. It's a very global company. It's an also, and more importantly, it's a merger of a bunch of different companies coming together to create this global mix. KPMG has 145,000 employees. And I recently did a talk at their, their Asia conference for all their partners. And the CEO went up and says, we have implemented a new global strategy. And then he added, this is our fourth global strategy. <laughs> And he said, the three first fail. But then he said, this time it is different. And I found it very interesting. He then explained how KPMG had done a customer survey asking the customers, when KPMG is at its best, how are we then? And asked them to come up with a few key words. And then KPMG took those words and turned them into their value statements, meaning not letting the employees define what they were, but letting the customers decide when the employees were the best. That's our values. Very interesting concept. One of, those cons one of the value systems that they now have is forward thinking, for example. But one of the five that they picked is global thinkers. That was not KPMG or the CEO saying, we need to be global. This was the customers of KPMG saying, one of the five most important things when we pick an accounting firm is that you have a global mindset. That's the world that is changing. Another interesting example is SAP. SAP is an extremely German company, or used to be. Because the last few years, they have been buying a lot of other companies in a lot of other countries, including a big company in America. SAP today is not purely German. It is now becoming a global company. One thing that they did very well is how they do R&D. Most American companies, they will put the R&D in Silicon Valley and say, we will attract the best people that we can find and put them in Silicon Valley, because it's the center of IT in the world. SAP says, we can't get them to come to Germany. That's not the Silicon Valley of the world. So let's do it smarter. So what SAP has done is instead put up 18 different, not R&D, just the R, just a research facility, 18 different R's in 18 different cities around the world. And they do that depending on where they can find the best people in the world. So for example, in Singapore, Singapore is the world Mecca for logistics, largest port in the, in the world, largest, best airport in the world, and urbanization. There's no more urban country in the world than Singapore. That means that the global research facilities for SAP in the world on urbanization and logistics is 100 PhDs in Singapore. And they do our research for SAP globally. 
good example. Now, there's no place that is more, no, no industry more connected to a country except for food and tourism than cars. Would you agree? Huh? German cars. Because German cars, they're good quality. Just like the Germans, yes? <laughs> Italian cars, because they're well, you know, it's designed, it's sporty, just like the Italians, yes? Japanese, because it's a pursuit of perfection, just like the Japanese. American cars are American. <laughs> just like the Americans. <laughs> Sorry, I lost it. And, and Volvo is safety, just like the Chinese, who now own Volvo. The thing, of course, is this is a not a way to think anymore. Because we all know that a BMW that is produced in Russia is still a BMW. It's not a Russian car, it's a BMW car. So I interviewed the market, global marketing director of Mini because I find it very interesting. Because yes, Toyota is Japanese and Ford is American, but Mini is what? Anyone? Yeah, so German, British. See, you can't agree. <laughs> That's because Mini used to be British. In the 1960s, so, you know, that's the whole thing. But it's not anymore because it's owned by BMW. Now, if you're the global head of marketing of, of Mini, how would you position Mini? Would you position it as a British brand? He said, no, I can't. Because what's the image of a British head, a car in the mind of, of people? It's this. You have to own two to have one running. Huh? <laughs> so you can't do that. So let's position it as a German car. Cannot do that either. You can't position a British car as a German car. You know, if you know anything about Germans and Brits, they, you can't do that. <laughs> so how to position it? Well, they are positioning it as a not connected to a country car brand. And interestingly enough, they, it was relaunched in 2001, meaning it was launched in the 21st century. It's the first car brand, global car brand, which is launched, not connected to a country. Then what about this? What about this iconic picture of the Mini with a Union Jack on, on top? How do you get rid of that? Of course it's a British car. So this is what Mini did during the last World Cup in soccer. They launched a lot of other Minis with a lot of other country flags on top. And if, Bra if Brazil won a game, they went to some really happy Brazilians who had a lot of flags in their hands and say, we'll give you the car for the rest of the night if you drive around just being happy. And now, they got, they got a lot of people taking photos of happy people driving Minis. Because the Mini is not a car from a country. It's a car that global metropolitan people drive, regardless of where they live. So here's another interesting example. Volvo, OK, is Chinese. But Volvo trucks is still? Yes, the brand is still Swedish. But if you are the CEO of Volvo Trucks, what are you CEO of? Are you CEO of a, of a global company or a Swedish company? You are CEO of a global company because CEO, I mean, Volvo Trucks, the company, is not Volvo Trucks, the brand. It is also all these brands. It's the American Mac, it's the Indian Asher, it's the SDLG, and so on. It's a bunch of different brands from a different bunch of different markets, and Volvo Truck Company owns them all. Yes, they're still using local brands on local markets, just because some people are still not mentally ready to move on, but behind the scenes, they are making it one. Meaning, for example, that R&D for engines for small trucks is made in one R&D place only for all the brands, meaning it's the same engine but from the same people. And behind the scenes, they're now trying to build a brand, a company behaving as one, and just like you're transforming your brand, they will transform theirs, meaning that the different brands will not stand from trucks from different countries, but trucks of different sizes. So what can we learn from Volvo? Well, I asked the CEO, actually the, last, the, the former CEO, Leif Johansson, who's been CEO for 14 years in Volvo, and I said, give me something that we can learn from you on how to go from being Swedish to being global. And he said, I can teach, I can, I can give this one. He asked me a question. What do you think? What do you think is the corporate language of Volvo? What do you think? Anyone? 
Ah, huh? English, of course, not Swedish, obviously, so it's English. But what kind of English? Is it British English, American English, Oxford English, Swedish English? What kind of English is it? Anyone? Huh? It is, and please pay attention, bad English. <laughs> If you ask me, this is brilliant. <laughs> Bad English is, by the way, what I'm giving my speech in, all right? <laughs> and I still think you understand what I'm trying to say. Bad English is a bad expression. It should probably be simplified English or not so complicated English. But the whole con concept of the whole course is to make it as simple as possible, but not simpler. That means, for example, that if you're English, or British, or American, or Scottish, I might add, <laughs> and you, let's say, go to Taiwan, and you try speak with a Scottish accent in a native English with a Taiwanese who's not so good in Chinese, and a Ta I mean in English, and the Taiwanese doesn't understand your Scottish, it's not his fault, it is your fault. You're not speaking English in a way that he can understand. You're not speaking bad English. And it also means the opposite. It means that the Korean or, or the Argentinian, who's not so good in English, realizes that ah, it's OK. I can speak the English I have because I'm speaking bad English. And he speaks up, which means not only the Americans and the Brits are saying everything in meetings. Because they might be smart, but not all, maybe there are other smart people in the room as well. And do you know, let's just quickly do this. How many of you in this room are native English speakers, as English as your third language? OK, and here you have something to work on. <laughs> In the book, I, wrote, I, write, I, I write about the things that you are good at as a, as a global company, but there are some things you're not so good at. You're far over overrepresented with native English speakers. Do you know, in all the English conversations happening around the world in a given moment, how many percent are between two people who are both native in the English language? How many? How, what's the percentage? Four. 94% of English conversations is between two people where at least one, and most probably both, do not have English as their mother tongue. Which means that the official global language of the world, world see, is bad English. <laughs> Think about that, you Brits and Americans. You're the minority. OK, now I'm going to finish this. Uh, I'm going to finish to see where will this bring us into the future. Because the biggest problem with the digital divide was not the people who did not get the internet. It was the people who did get the internet and didn't realize what they could really truly do. The ones who took one step but didn't start running. And if that is the problem with a lot of global companies, that they have become global, they think they're much better than a competition, and they're not taking full advantage of what the global company could mean. So let's look at two examples of what that means. This is the Beijing Olympics 2008, an amazing, very successful, best Olympics ever. OK, I know London doesn't agree, but at least up to that point. Now, before the Olympics, if you were China, you had a big problem, and that big problem was Tibet. Because how are you going to make sure that the Beijing Olympics was not totally about Tibet? Of course, what they did, super smart PR strategy, they did the largest torch re relay in the world. So they went the torch went around the world many times, and every time the torch came, came somewhere, there were Tibet demonstrations. So when finally the Olympics arrived, we were so tired of Tibet, we didn't talk about that during the Olympics. Super smart. Now, where will you have the most demonstrations about Tibet? France, obviously. Because <laughs> they're involved in Tibet, and they like to demonstrate. And this is where, if you don't know how smart Chinese people are, Pay attention. So what did China do? Well, for Paris, they took a woman in a wheelchair <laughs> to carry the torch. And what did the French do? Couldn't stop themselves. Attacked anyway. <laughs> and suddenly, the story turned 180 degrees. It was not about Tibet. It, how, how can you attack a woman in a wheelchair? <laughs> so what happened in China? Huge demonstrations on the internet. Go boycott French companies. Boycott Carrefour. The day after, Carrefour quickly released a press statement. We are not a French company. <laughs> we are a grocery store. <laughs> and China is very important for us. 
we would do nothing to make Chinese people angry because they have 500,000 employees and yes, France is still their biggest market, but in the future it won't be. And if you are the CEO of Carrefour, you're not CEO of a French company, you are CEO of a global company. And the last example is an extremely interesting one. I don't know if you remember it, but someone, probably America or Israel, wrote a virus that could go inside a nuclear power plant and shut it down. Did you read this? This is like a James Bond movie. It's called Stuxnet. Stuxnet. It, was, went into, it went into nuclear power plants in Iran, and it was going to shut it down. Here's the problem for whoever did that. Those nuclear power plants were not from Iran. They were from Siemens. And Siemens is not a German company. It's a global company. And they do nuclear, nuclear reactors, and they sell it. And the virus was fined by uh, Symantec, a global antivirus company. And there was a huge debate in America about how can Symantec help the Iranians. But the guy at Symantec said, we are not beholden to a nation. We're a multinational private company protecting customers, in this case, Siemens. And think about what this really means in the future, when more companies start to behave like this. I met with the CEO of Volvo. I also met with the Ministry of Trade of Sweden. And she's still talking about how Sweden needs to promote Swedish companies. But the CEO of Volvo doesn't take a single strategic decision based on Sweden. The analogy here is a boy and a girl who used to date. And the boy breaks up with the girl, and the girl still thinks they're dating. <laughs> the company's moved on. The country still thinks that their companies are taking their sides. There's nothing more pathetic than someone who still thinks that you're dating when you're not. <laughs> so I'm now going to conclude. I'm going to conclude with what one thing I think gives the most important thing for a global company to do, or if you work for a global company. And a lot of people will tell me that, come on, roots are important. You need to know where you come from, blah, blah, blah. And that's all true. And you would have a problem because you don't come from anywhere. You're John Slons of Sol. It's a mix of everything. So your roots are not so deep. That means, yet yeah, that is true. It means a company that is a merger of a bunch of different companies need to work much harder on having a good culture and strong values. Otherwise, you will fall over just like a tree. And you're doing that, which is good. But the pe what the people forget who talk about roots are so important is that they're using an analogy. And they're using the analogy of a tree. And a tree that doesn't have roots will tipple over and die. But it is equally true that a tree that doesn't have any branches is also going to die. And the branches is your ability as a person, as a manager, as a company to stretch out into the world and find energy wherever you can find it and bring that energy back into the trunk of the tree, which is the core of the company. Yes, a company that doesn't have roots will die. It is dangerous to be rootless, but it's equally dangerous to be branchless. That would be my advice to you. Try to spread your branches as far as possible. The Icelandic people have a word. The word is heimskur. It comes from the word home, heimskur, homeskur. It means a person who never travels, who just stays in his farm all his life. That's a heimskur. Heimskur means moron. <laughs> Thank you very much.